What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to be commencing the Fall 2020 review. So, for those of you who are new to the channel or found my channel through the full season, if you don't know, uh, at the end of every season, uh, once all the shows have wrapped up that we're watching, uh, aside from the ones that obviously carry over into multiple cores and multiple seasons, um, we do a review like this. I have Tier Maker open right now, as you can see. We rank uh, anime on a scale of 10 to 6. Uh, the reason why we stop at 6 is that if a show is 6 or below, typically I would have already dropped it. Uh, if I think it was that low in rating, there's very few shows uh, that end up going there. More often than not, when I drop a show, it's actually because uh, time constraints, because it's such a busy season, I already have so many good shows that I don't really want to add another to the list if it's not fantastic or gripping me. Uh, and it's also just personal preference more than anything. Whilst objectively it might be a good show, uh, it just doesn't appeal to me per se. For example, uh, Hypnosis Mike would be a good example. Um, I'm sure as as those types of shows go, not terrible. Uh, first episode choice is a bit weird, but it looked good. I just couldn't get along with the music of, of the show. And for a show that's heavily based on its music, that was just a deal breaker for me. So um, that's why we do the way we do. We've done this every season on the channel, winter, spring, summer, and now fall, of course. Uh, so the final one for the year. Um, Happy New Year, by the way. Let's hope 2021's uh, another amazing year for anime, at least, because 2020 was a fantastic year for anime, despite everything going on with COVID and uh, the world just seeming to crumble <laughs> every month. Um, despite that, anime held strong, and we got some really fantastic series, including uh, this season, which was, again, a very, very strong lineup. So what we're going to do is I have the 15 shows and uh, one movie thing, technically, OVA, whatever you want to call it, uh, that we, uh, so 14 and then one, uh, that we watched in the fall 2020 season. Jujutsu Kaisen and Higurashi will not feature on this list just because they're still ongoing. Uh, if you want to know my honest thoughts, Higurashi, easily at least a 9. Jujutsu Kaisen, again, easily a 9 already. They're going to be very, very high. Uh, when we come round to uh, the Winter 2021 ranking, that's where you'll see those shows, because it's not really fair to judge it halfway through. Um, and really, I should judge Galandino here, so let me just go fix that real quick. Okay, I, I added Galandino because technically that did finish this time. I can't remember if I graded it in the... what would have been? The uh, spring season. I don't remember if I actually gave it a ranking based off that, but we'll give it a proper ranking here now that the show's actually concluded and we've uh, wrapped it all up, so... I have the 16 shows here. We're going to go through the alphabetical order. I'm going to put them up, talk about them a little, uh, what I liked, what I didn't like, hopes and wishes and things like that. Um, this is got, not going to be the most in-depth review you've ever heard, but this is how I like to do my end of season reviews, just to go mull over my thoughts. And I guarantee I'll be switching some of these around uh, during the video uh, as I discuss, discuss them and like, well, am I really give it that high if I'm rating this one this low and things like that. So. Without further ado, let's start off. Uh, first show is Adachi and Shimamura. Oh boy, this was a very, very nice show. Um, very, very nice show. I love the way... I love the pacing, first of all. It was slow, but not crawling, essentially. Um, so we had reasonable development, especially with uh, Adachi. She got, I think, a bit more of the focus early on. But then we started to see Shim uh, Shimamura's side... Um, especially with uh, Tarashan and uh, the way she opened up to people. Um, I really want a season two of this. I don't know if that's likely, um, because the romantic development was ultimately slow, even by Japanese romance standards. Uh, normally, romance is a very, very slow in anime format anyway. Um, but even so, the general aesthetic, the characters they introduced, the relationship they had, it's a 9 out of 10 for me. I think, as as my romances go and as my uh, shoujo ai or yuri romances go, very, very good uh, adaptation. I would have liked the progression to be a little faster, but because they did it so slow and they developed the characters where it makes sense for it to be slow, rather than just, uh, oh, I'm, it's too awkward to say anything, but seeing how their actual inner monologues are and how they interpret the world and their friendships and such... It, would, it just made sense for him to not have a final confession by the end of it. And as a result, I think it made it a bit better than trying to shoehorn it in right at the end. So 9 out of 10 for me on that one. Akadama Drive. Oh boy. This is an interesting one. Because as this show goes... Great OP, by the way. It's on my playlist now. Um, I think, honestly, the weakest part of this show was the storyline. 
because it was a bit all over the place and it was it was crazy but it worked the characters were really nice i love the way they did it each every uh, each and every character uh doctor was great uh hoodlum and uh brawler their little bromance was great uh cutthroat was fantastic courier probably my least favorite out of all the characters if i'm honest but that's i still enjoyed his character um i think the overall storyline was quite especially towards the end it became a little more rushed and we didn't really get a conclusive ending on it despite being an original work that didn't really end in a good way 8.5 or 8 i think the question is, did the... I mean, the overall art style was incredible. The soundtrack was incredible. It's just let down by the story, I think. I'm going to go 8.5. Well, no, we're going to go 8.5. I think even though the story was not as solid, everything else about the show was incredible. Art direction, sound effects, everything was spot on. Just the story was lacking. That's my only real critique. Uh, next up, Salt Lily Bouquet, huh? This show had no business being as good as it was. Like, realistically, this type of show normally ends up around about here. The 6.57 sort of category. But Shaft giving it production value. Actually nice characters and art style. The fighting animation being great. I mean, it's competing with Akadama Drive. In terms of overall enjoyment. The question is, do I rate Akadama higher or Assault Lily higher? That's actually a tough one. That's way tough. Also, banging OP again. Um, just before I make note of that. Because I can't really do a dedicated video on OP and ED songs and soundtracks. Because it would just be me talking. And at that point, if I can't include the actual song in it. Which would just be a whole copyright hell. Um, especially with uh, certain shows being uh, Moby related, unfortunately. Um, yeah, this is the best place I can talk about OPs and stuff. Banging OP. Absolutely love it. Do I rate it higher than Akudama, though? I'm going to say, for the purposes of this, because I haven't really done this in previous seasons, but I'm going to start doing it now after I realize that I could do this. The further to the left it is, the higher I'm rating it. So if you're on the left-hand side of this list, so say I put... This is not how I'm ranking them, but say I have this. The one on the farthest left is the higher rated of, of the lot. That's, that's how I'm going to do it. And I think I'm going to rate Assault Lily over Akudama Drive. But do I even put it into... Oh, do I even put it into a 9? There's so much... Okay, I'm going to put it as 9, actually. Below Adachi, just because... The overall project of Assault Lily is not done. Like, that's what I can take pride in. Because the Last Bullet game, which might include some extra story-based info, hopefully, if it uh, remains popular, that is coming in uh, January 20th, I think it was, like... I'm fairly certain it was meant to be end of January, but I think they changed the release date to be the 20th now. Um, so if anyone can just double, just confirm that for me. But because there's so much interest around this show for me and the world building that it's done, I'm going to put it above Akadama Drive. Akadama Drive was a very nice self-contained thing. Um, it, I still have a lot of questions, like what happened to the region in between Kansai and Kanto? What, uh, where did brother and sister end up going in... Uh, where did they end up going began with an S, didn't it? Something like that. I forget. It's the, um, it's south of where, um, uh, Kanto is, or Kanto. Geography is not my strong point. At least Japanese geography. Um, but Salt Lee has so much more of a world around it. Like, have you seen the huge designs? There was a comment on the finale, I believe, uh, that linked some of the art designs for the, the huge, and they're so interesting. Like, they're so much more organic than I expected, because in the anime, they're very mechanical, and like, these machine entities and stuff like that. But then when the, the Ultra Class washed up onto the beach, very organic. Seeing some of the other designs that uh, are in this like concept art or drawn art, very organic. And it makes me very, very interested as to what's going on with the actual huge. Like, I want to know more about them. And that world building is very, very good. Like, if a show can include that level of world building, I, I very much praise it for that. So that's why I'm going to give it a 9, I think. Um, next up, Burn the Witch. We watched this very, very early on. Uh, I don't know why Crunchyroll decided to have it as free 20-minute parts instead of a one-hour OVA. 
I don't know if that necessarily helped it or hindered it in any way, but whatever. Uh, if you're uh, not, uh, if you're from Japan, uh, how did they air it over there? Did they do it as a one-hour OVA, or did they also do it the split way that Crunchyroll did? Uh, please let me know. Um, it was good. I liked the world. I liked the main cast. It was just too short. I think is the main detriment to it. Uh, I very much enjoyed it. I enjoyed seeing London. I enjoyed the whole Dragon storyline. I, it just was too short. I think if this had been an actual full TV project, or at the very least, an hour 40 movie, for example, I think it would have done much better. This is very much the curse of one hour productions. One hour is long enough to allow you to do a complex story, but not long enough to really flesh it out. It, it's kind of in the middle ground of one-off like specials and a full-length fledged movie because I will stand by it. Every movie I watch that ends up being like an hour, an hour and ten, pretty much every single time I watch one, I'm like, this would have been so much better if it was an hour and forty. Like every single time I say it, and the same is true for Burn the Witch. Very enjoyable. It just needed more. It, it kind of needed more. Whilst it was a very nice self-contained story, I feel like the romantic or emotional development between uh, the black-haired girl, I forget her name, I forget the character's names now, but between her and the guy that they were saving, uh, who's like uh, got a special affinity with dragons or something along those lines, um, I feel like that was a bit rushed and kind of just put in there so you know it's there, rather than actually built up enough. Um, so I would have liked to have seen, if they had more screen time, maybe develop that a bit more, but overall still a very, very enjoyable series. Oh boy, now we start the controversial one. Or the controversial ones, I should say, seeing the next two. The day I became a god. See, if it had the emotional impact it was meant to have, it could go up here. But... Where does it stop? That's the question, how low does this go? Because I think if I'm going to be overly generous, this is as high as it's going. A 7. I think that's as high as I could give it. But the main character was so unlikable. Just so unlikable. And his attitude in the end was just realistic. I'll give it that. It made sense for him to be the way he was. But for then that to get a happy payoff and to reward that? No. No. I, I just don't enjoy that. That should not have got uh, that should not have got a happy end for the way he treated her in that state and everything that was going on. It was very forced to get them into that point to like for her to see him off. Like, why would she agree to that after knowing he's got nothing to do with her? He's just acting out of his own selfish. Really, he's acting out of his own selfish interests. He's not necessarily thinking what's best for Hina. He's thinking what's best for him. And somehow he gets rewarded for that. And then here's the issue with the love. Like, it's very hard to interpret because of the Japanese language and how it has a bit more nuance in the way it expresses love. Like, at least compared to what a direct English translation is. With direct English, English subtitles, it's kind of implied that there is a romantic affection between the two. Now, considering the situations they're in, I don't think that was the intent, but it's hard to gauge that. I think it's meant to be more of a family love type deal, but again, it's kind of ambiguous in that sense. I think because of that, that's also going to be a mark against it, because if you're going to... For a show that's based on emotional connection, you don't really explain the emotional connections that much, and what you build out of them isn't very clear-cut either. So, you should really know if it's a romantic or family love situation. The fact that it is kind of ambiguous is, again, just not great for it. And the way they forced us to straight shoot the movie after she just came out of that, that rehab thing, after, well, she's only been in that place for, what, like, a week or two? Right? Like, he got two weeks with her. No, she's been in there for a long, long time, right, if I remember correctly, because... It was, there was a time jump between when he said goodbye and then by the time he saw her again, right? I forget the exact time measurement there, but she'd been in rehab all that time, was slowly gaining trust, 
he's there a week and all of a sudden she's like a completely different person almost. Yeah. I don't know. Do I even go even harsher to say it's a six? I feel like maybe I'm being overly harsh at that point, but... Okay. Ask myself this. What were the redeeming qualities of this show that really made it good? Well... I wish I was joking when I said I wanted to plan that port. I really am struggling to think of something that I truly enjoyed about this show. I mean, it looks good, but it's key work. It's meant to look good. Um, and it looking good was not... Like, here's the thing. With something like Assault Lily and Akadama Drive, looking good is a huge impact for it because it allows for cool designs. It allows for complex fight animation that actually has impact. In an emotional-based story, what it looks like is less important. And honestly, I'm, I'm tempted to even demark it because... Hina's condition was very, very, very tame, considering what she'd just gone through and what is meant to be implied from the syndrome. Oh, and that even brings up another thing. Like, Yota said he's going to, like, try and become a researcher and look into her condition to help and all that. Which means that her condition is ultimately still faltering and she's getting worse. She's been shown to be getting nothing but better over time. So why does he need to research into it if it's not seemingly having a negative effect on her and she's going from strength to strength, she's learning to walk again, it's like... Why would he need to necessarily research her if he, she's getting better? Again, it's another ambiguous point where it's like, if she was genuinely getting worse, that would make sense, but she's just in a constant state of, like, still how she is, but slightly improving... I'm going to give it a 6. I I might get some flack for that, but I don't care. I'm giving it a 6 because there's just so many things I nitpick on it and so many things that I wish were done differently. And ultimately it failed on its one purpose, which was to get, deliver an emotional story. It really didn't. Like, it's going to be a very forgettable story, I think, by the time... By the time I finish winter season, I'm going to forget most of this show. Well, I won't because I'm so angry as if I'm going to remember it. But you know what I mean. It's just it's just kind of a forgettable story that I don't think had any real impact on me at all. Yeah. But I... One thing, I'll say something good about the show. The way they depicted Hina's father was fantastic. I really appreciated the way they depicted that and the scene with Yota and the father. I really enjoyed that scene because it was the one of the more real scenes of the show that just made so much sense and was kind of relatable in a weird way, even though I've never been through something like this. It was still relatable in the way of how the different mindsets conflict between an adult mindset and a teenage adolescent mindset. It was a very nice meeting of worlds and definitely helped in the situation. But after that, it all just went downhill. So I'm just going to give it a six. Okay, controversial opinion number two. Journey of Elena. This show was so much better when it was being happy-go-lucky than when it was trying to be serious. The serious elements did not work. Episode 3... I appreciated more over time. In the moment, I was like, why? But I slowly appreciated it more over time, and it's like, yes, not every story is happy. That makes sense. There is... There is a beauty to tragedy in a weird sense. Like, if everything's always sunshine and roses, then it just becomes stale. You have to have tragedy to back up the comedy and everything like that. So I I appreciate tragedy in stories. But in this, it just, no. Just no. Um, and episode 9 was pure shock factor. Beyond that, I think it kind of failed to stand up on itself. But it was good looking. The lighthearted moments were fantastic. The character development for Elena... Uh, Fran and Sheila and uh, Saya, I appreciated those. The recurring characters were very nice. I think I'll give it a 7, because I didn't hate the show. But I just feel like it kind of... And the ending. The ending. Kind of ambiguous, and from reading it appears as though... There's like a whole alternate universe timeline thing going on, and these are all real Elenas that are all pre-existing. I don't know if that's a spoiler to it, but I don't care at this point. 
Um, it's just, it wasn't very well depicted. Like, I thought this was just her inner conscience and all the different paths of her that existed simultaneously that all collided together to make her a very complex character that doesn't seem to fit in any one category. Like, I thought that's why they were going with it, but no, it looks like there's, there literally are these different Elenas out in the world. So, yeah. That was kind of a confusing point. Not very well expressed. Maybe a season two would express it a bit better, but, eh. Overall, it was enjoyable for the lighthearted moments, but beyond that, it kind of didn't really hit as well as I think it could have. So that's why I'm going to give it a 7, at least. Um, next up, we have By the Grace of the Gods. What a pleasant surprise this show was. What a pleasant surprise this was. I think I'm going to give it an 8. There's not really much to say about this. Art style was very simple, to put it lightly. But the characters were fun. Uh, the way they interpreted him and his slime uh, taming abilities and his overall growth and going on the business route... It was enjoyable. Uh, it wasn't anything super spectacular, hence why I'm not putting above an 8, really. Uh, but it was a very chill, relaxed show. Enjoyable. I'd watch more. Like, if this uh, got a season 2 and had more content, I'd watch it. I very much enjoyed it. Um, it was just a very fun show that I've enjoyed, so... I think I'll just give it an 8. Nothing really more to say. Kuma Bear. Again, this is a very similar vein. Except I think I'm going to put it above Grace of the Gods, at least in the 8 category. I might even bump it up to 8.5 because it was such a good time. Also, ED is an absolute bop. Um, and I can already hear it in my mind. Like, it just, it just naturally is a very catchy song. Uh, I think I'm going to put it at 8.5, but... Ooh, actually... Below or above Akudama? That's actually a really rough choice. Ooh. I'm going to put it below. Uh, oh, that's a very tough choice. I'm going to put it below for now. I'll mull it over my head a bit more. But, ooh, that's a very tough one. See, if I had like 8.4, 8.5, 8.6... Uh, then maybe I, this would be a bit easier. But even then, I think that's very, very tough. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that one, uh, because that was kind of interesting. Uh, Million Lives. I think I'm going to put that at 7.5. It was good. Yeah. Mm. Mm. No, I'm going to put it at 7. Same as Elena. Um, I think this show improved over time. By the time it got to the end of the show, I think I appreciated it more. Because uh, it kind of hit a spike, what was it, around about the mid-season? Was it the mid-season where they started giving uh, Yotsia uh, some actual backstory and some character development? That was nice. Um, and now now that we know there's a season two coming, which is still wild to me, but I guess they already planned that before they even released season one. Um, I, ha I get the impression, at least from what you guys tell me, that season two and where the content leads on from this is where the show starts to pick up a bit more. And knowing Yotsuya has now developed a bit more, he understands the consequences of his actions in this world and the whole parallel world system and why it's happening, etc. I think the show has a lot more interest available to it to explore. And I think for that reason, I'll give it a 7. The sequel, I imagine, will probably do better if it maintains that. However, I have heard that maybe the, it is a bit more action focused by the end and i don't have much confidence in this studio to do action so maybe it might say seven we'll see but i think if this had actual good animation for fighting and action scenes maybe this would go up to 7.5 but i'll keep it at seven for now moriarty the patriot oh boy hmm this is a tough one do we give it a full 10 you know you know I think I am. I think I'm going to give this a full, time, uh, full 10. OP is amazing. Music is great. The interpretation of uh, London, fantastic. The art direction, fantastic. The characters, fantastic. I Can I fault this show on anything? 
See, that's the point. That that's what really determines the ten. How many faults can I find in the show? Can I find any? Now I think about it. What was really bad about this show? Anything? I don't think so. Like, Moriarty is a fantastic character. Sherlock and Watson are fantastic. Miss Hudson, nice to see her for the brief moment of time. The way they're telling the story from different perspectives, like they're following Sherlock and Moriarty simultaneously, fantastic. Because normally when you have a Sherlock production, you're following Sherlock and then you meet the big bad villain Moriarty and all that, but watching them both simultaneously working around each other, fantastic. The intrigue for next season, uh, seeing uh, Mycroft, oh, what was the name of the voice actor? I forget his vo his name, but my god, that voice is just like, oh, I, oh, yes. Um, I, I'm in love with that voice actor already. Um, so, seeing Mycroft, fantastic. Queen Vic, looks like we're going into Irene Adler stories as well. Oh, this is just fantastic. And the fact that they're doing a part two and they consciously split it into a multi-parter fits it so well. The 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 two part episodes to keep the mystery going, it's just a fantastic show. I cannot recommend this enough. Um, it's one of my favorites of the year, let alone this season. And yeah, it's definitely getting a ten. Hundred percent deserves a ten. So glad I watched it. Um, Talents Nana next. Hmm. This is another one where it's kind of tricky. I definitely enjoyed it more than Assault Lily, I think. Particularly by the end. I think I enjoyed it more than Adachi. Do I give it a 9.5? I think the beginning was a bit slow. A little bit. Beginning was a little bit slow. I'm going to give it a... If I knew it was getting a season 2, maybe I could give it a 9.5. But I, there's no sequel confirmed yet, I don't think. I'm going to give it the highest 9 rating. The beginning was just a bit slow. And can I really appraise a show that killed off my favourite character? <laughs> um, no, Mystery was too pure for this world. She, I, I was saying it throughout the entire show. She's too good for this, for this world. She doesn't deserve this. And... Ah. Oh. See... This was one of the most emotional impacting moments of the season, was seeing Mishiru's final scene like that. And that wasn't even really the main intention of this show, was to have that emotional impact, but it just hit it. And this is where I, uh, the day I became a god should have... This is where it should have really been shining, but it got outshone by Among Us the anime, like, for crying out loud. I'll think about that one. I might bump it back up to 9.5, we'll think. No bless. Surprise of the season. Or at least one of. Yeah, I think this might be surprise of the season. I did not expect to enjoy the show anywhere near as much as I did. Um, like it, it looked kind of like something that I really wouldn't enjoy. But ultimately, it became way more enjoyable than I expected. Um, did I enjoy it more than Assault Lily? I don't think I did. I might put that as a 9 as well. I'm stacking the 9s this time, aren't I? I really am, but it, this was a banging series, uh, season, rather, and Noblesse was great. You know, that's tough. That's kind of tough. Considering the finale, I think I'll leave it at nine. I think I'll leave it at 9. The DA5 arc was entertaining and was nicely paced. The following arc with uh, Rascalea and the previous Lord and everything that's going on with that. It was, a, it was a good mystery that they kept layering on and they didn't reveal all immediately. Uh, so I appreciated that. Uh, the actual animation was pretty good. Uh, better than I expected. Uh, the characters were great. I enjoyed pretty much all of them for the most part. Um... Yeah, we'll give it a low 9. I don't want to put it above Assault Lily, just because I have more interest in the world of Assault Lily than I do in the world of Noblesse, but it's close. Sigadrifa. Hmm. I think I'll put it at 7.5. I think it'll slot in at 7.5, because... The animation let me down a bit. 
Good OP as well, by the way. Um, but the plane fights were kind of secondary for a lot of it. The story with Ragnarok and such was a bit iffy. Overall story was not as solid as I think it could have been. Despite having a lot of intrigue and a lot of interest with Norse mythology and stuff, it kind of petered out a little bit towards the end. Uh, maybe if I knew more of Norse mythology, I could appreciate some of it. But even then, even from what I could look up, it didn't really seem to gel that well. So we'll leave it at 7.5 for now. I think that's fair to it. It was still enjoyable. I enjoyed the characters that we had. Our main cast of four was a nice main cast. I like the commander. Uh, what was his name? Uh, what was his name? Satomi? Satsumi? Something like that. Somewhere around there. Um, so I'll leave it at some point five for now. Sleepy Princess in the Demon Castle. Easy 9.5. Easy, easy, easy 9.5. Question is if I even put it up to a 10. I mean, I have to, don't I? I have to give that a 10. It was making me laugh every single episode based on the same damn premise. It just got more and more convoluted. It was a great finale. The goddamn teddy demons are adorable. The OP is an absolute bop. The ED is a bop. The entire show was fantastic. I'm going to leave Moriarty ahead of it, though, just because I have more interest in what's to come, and it seems to be more of a project that is going to continue to get better. This was very self-contained and fantastic. But I have a lot more intrigue personally into Moriarty and the world that they're building than what uh, CP Princess did. But still an absolutely incredible show. Absolutely incredible. Like I knew it would be an entertaining show. I didn't expect it to be that entertaining with how goddamn funny and ridiculous it ended up being. Absolutely incredible. Tonikawa. Oh boy. <laughs> it's another 10 contender. It's another contender. Oh, this is so tough. This is too tough to... Mm. I really don't know. See, I want to because I loved this show. This was a fantastic romance anime because it just went against the norm. Like, not entire. Not entirely. I Also, fantastic OP. And it's one of those OPs that, like, the full version and the 90-second uh, version have a very differing style, almost, in the way they build up, to the point where they're both fantastic in their own right. Because normally the full version is just an extended version of what the 90-second uh, one is, or it's going to be completely different and kind of weird to adjust to. But the full version is even better, I think, than the 90-second version, despite hearing the 90-second version first. But I think I'll drop it to 9.5. As much as I love it, and as adorable as these were, I'm going to give it 9.5 just because I think as good a romance as it was, it was not peak romance. Just because whilst it was a married couple... They just use that as a different framework to go through some of the similar events of a relationship. And learning to be in a relationship with each other. So they just use it as a different pretext. So I think for that, I'm going to give it 9.5. Also just because the whole Tsukasa mystery was kind of unresolved. And we didn't really get any further hints beyond... Well, it's kind of implied that she's Kaguya from the stories, right? It's kind of implied, but nothing really went beyond that. So I think I'll leave it at 9.5 for that. That's the only thing I can really demerit it on. Otherwise, it would be a 10. If I knew this was getting... Well, I mean, it's getting an OVA, to be fair. So the OVA will definitely help out. Um, but I think I'll leave it at 9.5 for now. I think that's fair to it. And then finally, Galandino. See, if we were just rating this on the first half, and I think I probably did rate this on the first half in spring, I don't remember. This would be up here somewhere. Um, but unfortunately, the the animation quality, not the quality of it, but the, the animation scenes themselves were enjoyable and didn't really deteriorate in quality over the course of the time. In fact, they even got a little bit better, I would say. However, the live-action segments that were so crazy 
became very, very tame towards the end. I don't know whether that was the COVID effect or if that just because they ran out of ideas early on. I'm not quite sure. Um, you know what? Actually, I'm going to put it up to low eight. Just because that final scene, seeing the um, seeing the uh, the old guy that was originally with Dino, being able to see him again, that genuinely is semi-emotional, and I actually really enjoyed that. So I'll give it an eight just for that uh, ending bit, uh, bumping up from seven point five. I I just wish it maintained. If it maintained its craziness, it would be up to eight point five, possibly sneaking on nine. Although that's doubtful. But really, for what type of show it was, getting an 8 is still impressive, I think. And yeah, that's everything. Do I have any more changes to make? I don't... Okay, so Moriarty, my favourite, yes. Science, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, these four. Do I want to reorder these? Um... No, I don't think I do. Do I want to drop Noblesse down? I don't think I do. Okay. K Kuma and Akadama is a really, really tough one. Like, they're so... In my mind, they're just so equal in terms of their production. Ah... Uh... Maybe we go Kuma in front. I think if Akadama's story was just a little bit more cohesive, just a little, I'm not asking for much in that, then maybe it'll be above. But I think I'll put Kuma ahead. Oh, God, that's too tough. That's too tough to call. We'll put Kuma ahead. I'm going to say it now. Kuma's ahead, but like by 0 0.01 of a rating. Let's just make that clear because that's way too close. Okay, uh, Grace of the Gods, Burn the Witch, and Gal. I am happy with that. Sigrid for being 7.5. Am I putting Million Lives above Elena? I don't think I can. I can't put Million Lives above Elena. As intrigued as I am for season two the moments in elena where we actually had happy moments and fun stories and character building i think those make up for the misgivings that i have for the show overall so i think i'll put it above um i'll put it above million lives and then by the grace of god being six yeah i have no issues with that one anymore i'm ready to die on that hill i don't care um it might be controversial, might not be. Who knows? But I believe that is every show we watched over the course of 2020. At least full 2020. Um, not the ever, not everything we watched in 2020. There's so much more. Um, but yeah, I think that is my rating. Uh, just one more quick pass. Just in case. No, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Uh, Moriarty being my favourite of the season. I think that's fair. Very, very strong season overall, though. Um, I don't know if this is the strongest. I'd have to go and look at uh, previous uh, uh, seasons, but I can probably put... Uh, I'll tell you what, right now, I'll uh, I'll put up... Well, I'm not going to probably end up doing that, but maybe if I remember, I'll put up the uh, other seasons, uh, ratings that I ended up doing, so you can see uh, how uh, other shows uh, this year have uh, stacked up and just see if... Um, the uh, full season was any better overall in terms of how many high rated shows we got. I don't know if it was. Uh, last season was pretty solid as well for what it's worth, so who knows. But that's my ratings for this season. Thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, this actually ends up going a little longer than I expected. I didn't really quite expect to hit the uh, near 40 mark on this one. I thought it'd be more like half an hour, but hey, it means I have a lot to talk about these shows. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for your support this season. Uh, we'll be continuing on with Winter 2021. Uh, the first show's come out on Tuesday. Um, so this comes out on Saturday, I think. Probably. We'll see if I actually get it uploaded in time. But it should come out Saturday. And then uh, the season kicks off on Tuesday. And we have, uh, I think, three shows to start with. Um, but Sunday and Monday won't be empty days. I intend to get 
uh, World Trigger uh, uploaded. I also intend to start um, School Live uh, on Monday as well, as by requested by uh, IQ. Uh, and I think we did also have a new Patreon in the form of Wargle, so thank you, Wargle. Um, I think I might try and get that reaction request started on Monday as well. Uh, that way we have two episodes of World Trigger on Sunday, an episode of School Live, an episode of... Uh, uh, what should you recommend? S uh, Gear. I uh, will be starting Gear, which I feel like is me starting to go down a rabbit hole there. I feel like I'm going to be reacting to Symphogear for the next two years, maybe. <laughs> but we'll see. Um, but yeah, we'll probably do those two on Monday. That way we have two two on Sunday, two on Monday, then three on Tuesday, and then continue and so on and so forth. And I'll fit the re requested shows in the schedule some way. Um, but it's a very, very busy season. It's like 30-odd shows a week, which is... Uh, nuts uh, for my level of interest um, so we'll see but thank you for watching uh, don't forget to hit subscribe to see the winter 2021 season as it comes out on the channel uh, all the previous shows that I've watched from uh, previous seasons are now available in full playlists if you want to go see them um, they'll all still be timer format but from here on out any winter 2021 show that I upload including the uh, Patreon request shows uh, they will be uh, Patreon picture versions on Patreon uh, just £4 a month for the base tier and you will have access to those um, as they come out, uh, just slightly ahead of when the YouTube releases come out. YouTube releases start from 1 p.m. GMT. That's my normal time zone. Um, the pay uh, Patreon versions will start coming out, uh, depending on how quickly I can get them edited, from around about anywhere from like 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., somewhere around there. That's when they get uploaded. So you get them a few hours early as well, uh, if, if that matters to you. So that's it. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Until next time. See you guys later.